Ah, good afternoon. Excuse me. I was just copying a poem that my friend Alexander Hamilton wrote. At the youth of seventeen on the island of St. Croix. St. Croix. In yonder mead my love I found, beside a murmuring book reclined, her pretty lambkins dancing round, secure in harmless bliss. I bade the waters gently glide, and vainly hush the heedless wind. Then, softly kneeling by her side, I stole a silent kiss. Oh. Alexander Hamilton. That man, he had a knack for words. I have never known a man as brilliant as he, and sometimes as difficult as he. What can I say? Alexander Hamilton. He and I were opposites, as you know. About as opposite as you could be. He was married at 23 to a daughter of the richest men in all of the colonies. I, at 46, was not married yet. He was born on Nevis, a little island, a fly speck of an island in the Caribbean, to a wayward father and a mother who was a washerwoman. He abandoned them young. She died young. He took care of his siblings as best he could. He was recognized in the counting house where he worked. He worked for several of the merchants there on the island. And recognizing his genius, they chose to send him to New York that he should have his studies there. By contrast, I am the son of the richest landowner in Orange County, Virginia. 5,000 acres, over 100 slaves. I grew up in the lap of luxury. I had everything I wanted. I was, I was weak as a youth. I was feared that I should die young. But I was still enthusiastic and interested in the world. I, I, I actually was part of the militia there in Orange County, part of the Committee of Safety for a short period. I had one of those spells and I could not command the troops. I, I could not be a soldier. Which, of course, is the exact opposite of what Alexander Hamilton was. He was the ultimate soldier. He, he went to study at King's College in New York City. He was introduced to uh, Ro Robert R. Livingston, one of the richest men in the country, and, well, his stars went up from there. He formed his own artillery company with help from the aforementioned Mr. Uh, Livingston and Mr. Shiner now, and in the first battle he fought, George Washington recognized his brilliance on the battlefield and brought him in to be one of his aides to camp, uh, doing the order work, getting things done, something which is absolutely essential in warfare. You can have a thousand men on a battlefield, but they are useless. You do not have a thousand men behind them with pens. I decided that I should be the most well-informed person on the issues of republics, such that after the war I should be able to be, give good advice about our politics. Uh, Hamilton had no experience on these things at all, yet, yet he came into Congress, what was it, in, in, I believe it was in 79, and there we met and worked together and did accomplished marvelous things. We, he and I kept the war going. Without us, I doubt that the war would have succeeded. Half of Congress was filled with men who were useless, and other men who were worse than useless, they had nothing more to do than to fill their own pockets with gold, while men in the field were, were starving and had no ammunition. And this is where Hampton and I worked together. We, we put together a compromise that we should have an impost we should have a 5% impost on all goods coming into the country, which almost passed, or, and then Rhode Island refused to pass it. Then my country state, Virginia, they refused again to pass it. They rescinded their, and we had no money for the troops. Yorktown would not have happened. 
if Robert Morris had not made personal loans out of his own accounts to supply the money required to get the troops down to Yorktown. Oh, excuse me, I, I've gotten off on track here. Ah, so the thing that I admired most about my young friend Hamilton, who was six years younger than I, was that he got things done. We had a conference in Annapolis. We were going to talk about the waterways. We were having difficulties figuring out how we would navigate them and protect them. Five states showed up. I was depressed. The other representatives were depressed. We didn't think there was anything we could do. And then Hamilton, Hamilton said that this should be the clarion call that we had to improve our country. We needed to throw away the Articles of Confederation and build a new constitution. He proposed to the Congress, and Congress did not appreciate the suggestion. Then I took my friend aside and explained to him that sometimes you need to put it in words that they can understand or appreciate. And then if we merely phrase it as, we wish to have a conference to address the inadequacies in the Articles of the Confederation, this Congress was happy to pass. Now, one way of addressing the deficits in the Articles of Confederation is to throw them out and start all over again. But we didn't have to tell Congress that. So, we had our convention. All we had to do was get everybody there. The only way to do that was George Washington. George Washington was the only person in America who was admired uniformly. He had led us through the war and then retired. He went back to his plantation. He did not want to take power. He did not want to be king. He was a true Cincinnatus, the, the Roman uh, emperor who came in to save Rome and then went back to farming. Hence the Society of the Cincinnati, if you've heard of that. So I spoke to my good friend Washington. I worked closely with him during the war, Hamilton and I did. And I got him to say that he would be happy to come to the conference if everyone showed up. I didn't need to hear him say that he would definitely come, merely that he would consider coming. So that I could go to the different representatives of the different states and talk to them personally, explain to them that George Washington expected them at this convention. And of course, if George Washington expected them, how could they turn George Washington down? And so we had our convention. Fifty-five men stuck in a room for three and a half months. The true strengths of the Constitution is not its division into powers, the legislative, the executive, the judicial. It is very important, but the true genius of the Constitution is the compromises that we made that allow the people to ratify it. Without ratification, what is it? 4,400 and some words on a piece of paper? Anyone could have written a better Constitution but they couldn't have gotten it ratified. Which is meaningless unless the states ratify it. I thought that it should be simple. The states would see the obvious logic implicit in the Constitution and ratify it of their own goodwill. Hamilton was not so convinced and began to write a series of articles in the newspapers which he called the Federalist. He spoke in support of the Constitution he enlisted John Jay to help him write the first several articles, but John, uh, Mr. Jay fell sick and he turned to me for his help. And so together we wrote the remainder of the 85 articles. We, we eventually published them in several books like this one. Imagine that. Over a period of several months, we wrote 85 articles. There were times when we were in the publisher's office, finishing the end of one article while he was putting the type in for the beginning of the article. 
through the hectic, desperate time, but, but we did it. The time for votes came. State after state ratified, starting with Delaware and going down the coast and up the coast, and then it came down to New York and Virginia. We needed both states to ratify. The Union would not hold without those two states. We, we could do without South Carolina and Rhode Island, but we needed Virginia and New York. And so I went to my ratifying convention. He went to his. I fought with my Bet Noir, Patrick Henry, and he fought with his own George Clinton, governor of New York, who was not in favor of the Constitution whatsoever. Hamilton and I arranged for express riders to ride between Poughkeepsie and Richmond to keep us aware of the things that were going on in the other's convention. When at last Virginia ratified, we came up to New York, and New York, they finally had to ratify. They had no choice. They could not be surrounded by a country and sit there alone. And the people of New York City were overjoyed. They had a parade. They, they built a float, a frigate, a 27-foot frigate, which they named the Hamilton. Behold the Federal Ship of Fame. The Hamilton, we call her name. To every craft she gives employ. Sure, Cartman had their share of joy. And so they had a massive parade. They wheeled this glorious cart down Wall Street. And Alexander Hamilton was still in Poughkeepsie, working on the paperwork. And he never got to see his float. We were a country. Were we going to be a successful country? Who knows? But we had the chance for the first time in human history to build a country, a country of two and a half million people spread over a thousand miles, which is run by the people themselves. We are a republic where the people themselves run the country. And now the question for us was, the words of my best friend, Thomas Jefferson. The purpose of our country was this. We knew it wasn't true yet, but it was our goal to make it true. That was our ultimate objective, to make this true. We couldn't do it in our lifetimes, but I hope that you and yours have been able to make true our promise, the spirit of 76. That all men... Indeed, all people are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, and that among these rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been a pleasure.